So the outline of today, or this evening, should I say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I'm very rude. I haven't even introduced myself. Um, some of you may may already know of me, um, and of those and those of you who haven't, um, my name is Kat Keen, and I'm the health educator from Arthritis New South Wales. Um, my briefly, my background is in sports science and psychology, and I work with Arthritis New South Wales to disseminate education about arthritis, managing it from a um, physical um, disease point of view, but also from the biopsycho, uh, should I say psychosocial point of view as well, which is what we are doing here tonight, looking at that psychosocial side of chronic uh, pain or, or chronic disease. So um, I do apologize for the late intro. <laughs> so we're gonna have a look at what pain is, but briefly, because we've done this before in previous webinars and I'm not going to bang on about it um, I then quickly look at pain and arthritis so looking at what pain is in the context of arthritis and then of course the meaty part the juicy part of tonight's session is looking at what is cognitive behavioral therapy because we certainly have alluded to it in the past as a management tool um, and before we get into the activities that you might like to just listen to, you might like to um, participate in, um, I'm just going to go through a couple of prep tools to ensure that you're ready um, to have an open mind to take on these new um, cognitive behavioural therapy activities. So, as I mentioned, Firstly, before we look at CBT, I'd like to remind you all about pain. Um, and to do this, I'm going to let Laura Mir, uh, Professor Laura Mir Mosley take about five minutes to explain what chronic persistence pain is. Now, while some of you may not feel or, or some of you may not suffer from chronic pain, um, this video does a really good job of not just explaining chronic pain, but also just explaining pain in general. And it's important that we have some sort of base level understanding of pain and what influences it so that we, when we get to the cognitive behavioral therapy part, it will all make sense. Um, so fingers crossed that embedding this video has worked and all I have to do is press play. Um, Okay. There you go. Technology, right? Let's see if it works. All right. Can everybody hear it? Can you give me a thumbs up? Good. Oh. So widespread was this affliction that one in four people experienced it. The pain lasted for more than three months. It shadowed their daily lives, held them back from everyday activities, and the interventions they tried proved useless. Hey, pain, go away. We've tried it all, but still you stay. Moving less, taking pill. Knives and needles, and still we're sore. We can't take no more, no more. But the pain remains like a loyal companion. The people's hopes faded and they became resigned to living with the pain. Only now the pain was a beast. Then along came a group of researchers, of which I am one. Back off, big fella. I'm Professor Lorimer Mosley and I'm a pain scientist. Pain scientists are starting to think differently about pain and its causes. And we're making exciting discoveries, like how the way you think about your pain can change the way it feels. Over the next few minutes, I'll help you to understand your pain. Understanding is important because it can change how much things hurt and how much your body can do. And it can help you to tame the beast. First, trust me about this. Pain is not an accurate measure of tissue health. Pain is a protector. By making unpleasant feelings, your brain changes your behavior so you can avoid injury or your tissues can heal. Sometimes pain is not helpful, like phantom limb pain. You don't expect a missing limb to ache, but it does, and the pain is very real. So how do we explain this? Well, pain is a warning signal from your brain that depends on credible evidence to say your body needs protecting. Sometimes pain's too protective and you get unnecessary warning signals. Pain scientists now understand that there are many ways our nervous system ends up producing unnecessary warning signals. 
Take conditioning, for example. If you think of Pavlov's dog, every time food was offered, Pavlov rang a bell. Of course, the dog would salivate seeing the food. This went on for a while. Eventually, the dog was conditioned to salivate for the bell alone. Conditioning is just one of the ways your body learns pain. And the longer your nervous system produces pain, the better it gets at producing it. Your body learns pain. So what feeds this beast? Well, let's look at how pain works. In your body's tissues, there are specific neurons which normally only respond to harmful stimuli, whether mechanical, chemical or thermal. When they are activated, they send a warning signal to your spinal cord, which can in turn send a signal to your brain. This activity in neurons is called nociception, and it's happening all the time, but only sometimes results in pain. Most of the time, the brain protects you with other things, like movement. Once the warning signal reaches the brain, the brain makes sense of it based on the information arriving and a vast amount of information already stored. If there's good reason to think protection is required, then your brain makes pain. One of our amazing discoveries is that you can have pain without any physical stimuli. Thoughts and places might activate the warning signals and the pain feels exactly the same. It's not just your brain. Your spinal cord also learns how to generate unnecessary warning signals. So how do you know when your nervous system is learning pain? You may notice your pain spreads or comes on without warning. Your body feels odd and it's hard to move properly. Your pain changes quickly with your mood and small annoyances can set it off. Old injuries start to hurt again. You're more sensitive to stimuli and the longer the pain goes on, the more all of this occurs. The old way we understood pain could not explain these things and left many sufferers feeling like no one believed it was real or for it to hurt so badly, there must be a major tissue problem. But we now know how persistent pain happens. So how can you tame the beast? Pain is a very personal thing. There's no one size fits all solution. And while you probably have well thought out coping strategies, it's time to take a new approach to dealing with and reducing your pain. One that focuses on retraining your pain system. This might mean testing yourself physically and moving more than you normally would. Being honest about your current attitudes and beliefs can also help, as can asking your health professional new questions. How do I know if my pain system is being overprotective? How do I retrain my pain system to be less protective? How do I know if I'm safe to move? So be brave and have hope because it is possible to tame the beast. Visit our website for more information and questions to ask your health professional. Tamethebeast.org. There you go. What did you guys think of that? That's a bit of a rhetorical question, I suppose, but I hope that that um, was interesting for you. I hope that perhaps you learnt um, something new or something that challenged um, a belief or a bias or a thought that you may have already had about pain. Um, and that's important. And one of the ways um, in um, that the professor was talking about trying to, to change pain, to tame the beast, is through cognitive behavioural therapy. So to sum up that video, number one, when pain persists and becomes chronic, it also becomes more complex. So that's, that's an understatement. <laughs> and two, psychological and emotional elements can play a major role in the development of... Um, and the experience of pain. And these non-physical uh, components can help the brain learn to be in pain. So just like the classical conditioning with Pavlov's, Pavlov's dog. So the brain sort of learns to be in pain um, and rewiring the body's neural system to perpetuate the sensation of pain. So that's where we're at. And I guess that sort of sums up nicely um, Tame the Beast video. You can find a lot more of Laura Min Mosley's um, stuff on, on, on YouTube, on, on the website. Um, and he's as a fantastic storyteller and you can really help to, to break these larger complex um, um, ideas or theories down.
So pain is a multidimensional phenomenon just as you've experienced and arthritis pain or pain from arthritis is certainly no exception. But what I wanna start out by recognizing right now is that arthritis is what we call a mixed pain state. And what does that mean? Well, there are times, perhaps more so in some conditions than others, that your pain from your arthritis may well be acute. So that is from tissue damage that's associated and, and, and associated short-term processes. So there may actually be issues in the tissues. An example of that could be um, for someone with rheumatoid arthritis who is experiencing a flare, their immune system is actually attacking um, um, tissue, normal tissue healthy tissue and that causes damage and that causes inflammation and that causes acute pain. However, not only can we experience acute pain due to tissue damage um, with arthritis conditions, we can also experience chronic pain. And this is because of nervous system changes um, like the changes in the brain and other neural pathways. So we've got inflammatory processes that can change. We have the nervous system that can change those so central and peripheral nervous system changing, changes. And we also have psychological aspects as well that are part of the chronic pain. Um, and these are all very, very much interrelated. So any one of the chronic pain elements like inflammation, chronic inflammation, nervous system changes and psychological aspects. Any one of those can influence the other and vice versa and amplify our pain. So most types of arthritis are associated with pain and psychological dis distress and they can be clinically significant depression and anxiety. And there is strong evidence that arthritis conditions, namely rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, gout, and in osteoarthritis of the hips and the knees are associated with pain and psychological distress. Um, this distress can directly impact the central nervous system, causing central sensitization, so an increased feeling of pain and sensitivity, like the guard dog, like tame the beast, um, this leads to or can lead to chronic pain and the worsening of um, your affective distress, so your mood, for example. Um, and I wanted to ensure that I brought that up because I'm very well aware that um, unlike a previous injury that you may have had, so an injury of a muscle or um, a classic one is to have a disc herniation, so you hurt one of the discs in your spine, after that has healed, which it typically does, people then can go on and still have persistent pain. But that particular injury um, in itself um, inherently will, um, will heal and disappear. But when it comes to arthritis, and again, some conditions more so than others, um, rheumatoid arthritis and other inflama inflammatory um, arthritis conditions, there is, there is constant flare-ups and damage that, that does occur. So I just wanted to ensure that I made the distinction there that arthritis pain isn't just chronic pain. It also includes acute pain where tissue damage does still occur. Hence why it is called a mixed pain state. So how do you know that you are in chronic pain? And I do apologize for the very long list. I don't like a lot of words, but <laughs> I can't, could not put them on there because I think they're important to point out. So how do you know that you're in chronic pain? Well, the first one is that it often lasts longer than three months. So it would last longer than it normally should or take um, or, or however long it takes for a bone or a tissue damage um, to heal. And they all have slightly different lengths of time, like three weeks, four weeks, six. Um, but often pain that persists and lasts longer than three months is what we would call chronic pain. Um, often your healthcare provider can't, find a physiological cause, i.e. tissue damage. They, they can't find this anymore. 
Now, for those people with arthritis, like I said, sometimes there will come a time with that in that disease state. In times, it might ebb and flow, or there could be peaks and troughs of actual tissue damage. So sometimes there may be tissue damage. Other times, it's the disease might be fairly stable, and there isn't any tissue damage occurring at that time, yet you're still in a lot of pain. You may notice that your pain spreads or comes on without warning. You find that your mood could influence um, your pain experience, vice versa. Um, small annoyances can set it off. Um, old injuries, another one is an old injuries may start to hurt. You're sensitive to other stimulus, like, for example, um, touch or heat or cold. Um, you may start to get headaches. And then really, if, if the central nervous system is involved, um, so you have chronic pain, um, IBS and other um, um, GI upsets um, are also common. Um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, sleep. Sleep is another indicator that chronic pain um, uh, may be affecting you. And you may also stop to stop responding to specific um, medical treatment like analgesics, different types of NSAIDs or Panadols. Um, because if you've got chronic change, if you've got chronic pain changes or central nervous system changes, those particular medications don't act as well or as effectively um, as they did because the mechanism of pain or whatever is producing pain has changed. So your GP um, will be able to investigate this further and they'll do so with more questions, psychometric assessments, and they'll often refer you to a pain specialist, a, play, a pain clinic, um, if necessary, or a clinical psychologist. So that's pain. And so I hope you now have a little bit more of an understanding. If you didn't before, um, I hope you have a better understanding about what pain is now and what can influence it. And you don't need to have chronic pain to benefit from this session. Learning about your thoughts, your behaviours and your feelings help us deal with different pain states or flares. And it may even help reduce the risk of developing chronic pain. So with proper therapeutic attention, the brain can unlearn pain, paving the way to physical pain relief. That's what we want to try and do. And that's the goal here is to unlearn these learned behaviours or a learned fear or a learning of pain. Research shows that methods like education, so what you're doing now, writing, meditation, visualisation and cognitive behavioural therapy can significantly help the brain to stop this reoccurring pain cycle. So having a new mindset or challenging some unhelpful thoughts can provide welcome results. And here is where we'll start our deeper dive into CBT. So good question. <laughs> well, what is CBT? So what you need to know first off is that there is a dynamic relationship between what a person does, so that's their behaviour, what they think, their thoughts, and how they feel. Cognitive behavioural therapy aims to assist the person to change what they do and what they think to help make them feel better. The premise is that it is easier to change what we do and what we think. So it's easier to change what we do and what we think as it is to change how we feel. So those two things will often influence how we feel, but they're very much interrelated. They, there's just a state of flow between them. And it's been shown to be very effective in achieving a range of improvements in people who suffer chronic pain. Because if you recall from the video earlier, feelings of distress, anxiety, depression make our pain worse. So challenging those and changing negative thoughts that influence our feelings will then in turn help reduce the pain experience. And the same thing goes for our behaviours. CBD helps reduce our maladaptive behaviours, which in turn perpetuate the state of pain, the learned experience of pain. <clears throat> so 
the cognitive components of CBT include include um, or a focus on attention, memories, and beliefs. So what you think about pain and its impact on your life. And in cognitive therapy, eliciting a patient's belief about their situation is of a primary focus. This process will reveal basically what they say to themselves, so their inner thoughts, their, their self-talk. And typically it's negative and um, and certainly not helpful to the situation. So they may say things like, I have no control of my pain. It, it controls me. So essentially, the strategy here is to challenge unrealistic and unhelpful beliefs. And then the behavioural component of CBT includes looking at and focusing on the actions a person takes. So the observable actions, what they do. And the main principle for behavioural therapy here is to increase behaviours that are helpful to us and obviously reduce those that aren't. But first and above, above all, we need to find out what these unhelpful thoughts are and what these unhelpful behaviours or actions are. And so there are four basic steps to the CBT approach. Number one is to identify troubling issues. So worry, anger, self-image, whatever it may be. Number two is to grasp thoughts and emotions and beliefs. So noticing them, being aware of them, observing self-talk, what's going through your mind in a particular moment of distress or extreme pain. And then to identify that negative thinking. So examine the physical, emotional, behavioral processes, determine any cycles or patterns that may be unhelpful. And then to reshape that negative thinking. So changing thoughts to be more factual um, or more positive. Not all the time is it about positivity, um, but certainly is it accurate? Is it factual? And all of this will obviously take time, like learning anything new. It takes time. Um, so it's something that obviously we need to um, give a bit of uh, commitment to um, and persistence in. So before we jump into the activities of this evening, I think it's good to prep ourselves for this. So I want to prep you for the learning of something new. Um, and so I've got three prep tools that I'd like to just quickly run by you. Um, number one or tool one is the first and the most important prep tool when it comes to trying something new. It's acceptance. So accepting that you have persistent pain or that pain is going to be a part of your life um, because of the, the disease that you may have um, and being that being um, arthritis, which is a chronic condition. Um, and pain is the number one complaint about symptoms. So whether persistent chronic pain or the fact that you will have pain on and off throughout the course of this disease. So accepting that and then beginning to move on from that. And acceptance isn't about giving up. It's more about recognizing that you need to make or take more control and find out how you can better self-manage your pain. I think once we do that, we can move on. So it's a bit like opening a door and opening that door um, will allow you to look into and to try lots of self-managing opportunities. And the key isn't as big as what you think it might be, but you just have to be willing to use it and try it and maybe do things a little bit differently. The second tool is to have an open mind, okay, into trying something new and hoping and believing that it will work. Um, often we're used to taking a prescription medication, um, going to see somebody who may give us a passive treatment. So it could be a massage, for example, or, or some sort of therapeutic service like this. And we let other people help fix us. But sometimes we need, and, and it can be difficult to consider our thoughts and reflect on them and challenge them. But this is what CBT does. So it's a little bit different than taking um, a Panadol or going to get a massage, for example. A little bit of work needs to go into this. And the last tool being that 
you must have patience and then to see results, um, you must practice. So number one, unhelpful, unhelpful thinking styles. Now you would have received an email um, this afternoon. Yes, good. And that email had a, had a couple of different um, resources in it. It was just a Word document. Um, you could use that how you like. And in that Word document is these unhelpful thinking styles. Um, so it, it might, if you've got that up, that's great. And you can toggle between your screens. If you can't, don't worry, that's not a problem. So Activity one has us looking at unhelpful thinking styles. We will look at these and then what we're going to do together is apply them to a case study. And then hopefully I'm going to let you guys have a go at reflecting upon your own unhelpful thoughts and then we'll take it from there. So unhelpful thinking styles. Number one is the all or nothing. So if you're not first, you're last. I love that one. If you're not first, you're last. If I'm not perfect, I've failed and either I do it right or I don't do it at all, okay? There's no gray area. And sometimes it's okay, that kind of thinking, okay? Sometimes it's valid. Other times it's a little unhelpful. Overgeneralizing. So everything is always rubbish. Nothing good ever happens. Overgeneralizing, yeah, it, often that's not the case. Um, often we forgo seeing, we forget, or we don't actually recognize actually some of the good stuff that has happened. Mental filter, so only paying attention to certain types of evidence. Disqualifying the positive. Almost the same as overgeneralizing here because you're not, with overgeneralizing, um, you're often leaving out a lot of the positive stuff or vice versa. So discounting the good things that have happened or that you have done for some reason or another. So that doesn't count. That doesn't count that that happened. Jump into conclusions. So, um, so there's mind reading. So imagining we know what others are thinking. Gosh, don't we do that all the time? We project on other people our own insecurities and our, our thoughts. But in fact, they might actually be thinking the complete opposite. Fortune telling. So we just think that we can predict the future. Magnification and minimize, minimization. So blowing things out of proportion and just positive feedback loop on that. So, and it just gets bigger and bigger and we're catastrophizing or inappropriately shrinking something to make it seem less important. Some more emotional reasoning and assuming that because we feel a certain way, um, because we feel that way, it must be true. So I feel embarrassed, so I must be an idiot. So, um, again, very unhelpful because that's often not the case. Should and must. So these are critical words like should and must or ought and can make us feel guilty or like we have already failed. And labelling. So we label ourselves um, and we match that to our feelings. So I'm a loser. I'm useless. I'm an idiot. I'm a burden. And personalization, this is all my fault. So blaming yourself, taking responsibility, even when it really wasn't yours in the first place. So keeping those in mind, and if you've got the sheet, if you've got the sheet, that would be very helpful. And if you don't, it's okay. We'll all work through it together. Again, case study. I know it's a lot of words on the screen, but what we're going to do is we're going to read the case study. And then we're going to have a look at the way that this person thinks. And we're going to see if we can spot some of these unhelpful thinking styles. So let me give you a quick background. This is Jenny. She's 57, medical receptionist. She works in a busy medical practice. She has osteoarthritis in her right knee. She has had for years, but otherwise is fairly healthy. However, more and more, Jenny has been suffering with pain, but not just in her knee, it's her whole leg. It even goes up her buttocks and into her back as well. And there's been no confirmed disease in this area. Okay, so it doesn't seem like physically there's anything wrong. She also finding that her sleep is, is disturbed. Um, and although Jenny has tried or been on some pain medication, she still reports a high degree of pain to the point where she feels she can no longer work anymore. 
And this is how Jenny thinks. I've got no control over my pain. It controls me. If I can't work, I can't pay the bills, I'll lose my house and I'll end up on the street. And then she thinks my, her life is over. She thinks that her workmates will think that she's incompetent. She feels useless and she feels a burden to her family. There must be so much damage occurring in my knee or wherever it, this pain is because of how much pain I'm in. That's what she thinks. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm not even that old. And, well, this is all my fault. It's because I did X, Y, and Z when I was little. This is all my fault. So she often feels hopeless. She has seen a clinical psychologist and clinical psychologists did indicate that she was showing depressive symptoms, signs. And furthermore, Jenny's physical activity has greatly reduced and she's avoiding walking and moving when she doesn't have to. So... Um, I would like you to consider right now, take a minute or two, I'd like you to consider what unhelpful thinking styles does Jenny have? And what we're going to do is we're going to use um, the chat box. So if we put up the chat box, if you select that, you'll be able to, to see and use it. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to... Um, say or match them if you like so for example if i if i said can you spot the unhelpful thinking style all or nothing thinking and if you can spot that you put the number in the chat box so for example if all or nothing thinking i think number three is an example of that so you can go ahead and give that a crack. Okay, seven, this is all my fault. Oh, not quite with the, this is all my fault. So all or nothing, all or, or nothing. Um, it's kind of like she, she, gets to, she gets to live a life or not at all in a sense. Yep, so I've got a few more people coming in. One, two, and three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. Yeah, people. People are starting to get it. Fantastic. Good. Yeah. So my example there, the, and there certainly can be more than than one answer here, was the was number three. So my my life is over. Um, it's, it's very final in its thinking. That's for sure. <clears throat> So what about, what about this one? What about jumping to conclusions about what other people think? Jumping to conclusions about what other people think. What number best represents that? Yeah, yep, yep. Thank you, Susan, Fiona, Low. Oh, wow, too many people. I can't say your name. <laughs> yes, four, unanimously, number four. Yep, so... She thinks um, that her friends would think that she's incompetent, perhaps. Um, she feels that she's a burden to her family. Absolutely. Good. Um, what about catastrophizing the events of the future? Where do you see that? What number? Catastrophizing about the events of the future. It's just spinning. It's rolling. It's, it's a positive feedback loop. She says one thing and it expands to the next. Number two, unanimous. Fantastic. What about labeling? What about labeling? Where here has she labeled herself? So probably a bit of number four again, right? Because she thinks that she's saying she's, saying she's useless. Um, she's saying that she's a burden. Some people are saying six as well. But I think that might be more so. Um, the last one that I have here is a should or must statement, a should or must statement. So number six might be, this shouldn't be happening to me. I'm not even that old sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Great. Thank you for participating, everyone. That was really good.
So having reflected, so having looking, having had look at this case study, um, perhaps you can um, identify with Jenny a little bit or not at all. But if you do, perhaps you had those sort of unhelpful, those unhelpful thoughts. Okay, because what we're going to have a look at next, well, I'm going to ask about you, aren't I? Of course, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask about you. So what I want you to do now is just take a moment to consider your own situation and perhaps some unhelpful thoughts or thinking styles that you may have. Um, can you list one? Could you list two? Could you list three? One is enough. And then how does that thought or that style or that bias make you feel? So the example here is going to be, as you can see in my screen. So the unhelpful thought is this pain is forever. Sometimes this is what I think um, when my low back, um, when I get I have chronic pain, um, low back region, nothing structurally wrong with it, um, but I can have these flares in pain. Um, so when this happens, and it can be very bad sometimes, I just immediately start catastrophizing. But um, the unhelpful thought that I have is that it's going to be forever. And I kind of feel this is... It can, it can, I can catastrophize over it, but often or not, it's kind of, oh, sorry, that's all, all nothing thinking. And the way that it makes me, it makes me feel hopeless, basically. Um, so what about you? I want you to take a moment now to see if you can identify some of those, those thoughts, if you will. So I'm just going to give you a minute to do that. See if you can come up with, just one thing. All right, great. Thank you. I can see I can see some of you guys putting those into the chat box. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing those. I think it's good to hear these from other people as well because it you can start to realize that you're not alone in, in your thinking. Um, and remember, these are all sort of really normal um, ways to think about things. Um, but what we want to try and do is intercept and intercept those because what we don't want to have happen is that this way of thinking or behaving in a certain way is to influence our feelings and our feelings can then influence our pain. Okay. So what you will have noticed then with that uh, resource that you got sent is that you'll have something looking like this, a thought monitoring um, document or template. So the whole point of the previous exercise was to look at unhelpful uh, thinking styles or thoughts, to identify them in a case study, then identify them in yourself. Because then what you can start to do is expand that um, and, and work on something a little bit bigger being this, this kind of template. So looking at your situation. So looking at your um, situation, whoops. Um, so thinking about a situation that um, 
that may have been frustrating for you, um, caused you pain, or you thought um, increased your pain. Um, so who were you with? Where were you? When? Why? All the who's, all the W's, should I say? Then you'll consider the thoughts in that moment. I've got Joan's iPad drawing red marks all over the screen again. I'm sorry, I can't do anything about that. But Joan, can <laughs> please don't touch the screen. <laughs> um, thoughts. So what was going on through your mind at that time? And then the emotions, body sensations that you are feeling. And then you get to rate how you felt as well. So again, this is all about trying to identify um, situations that might trigger thoughts and those thoughts that can influence feelings and sensations, essentially. And this is all tied into managing your, um, your pain um, in the umbrella of arthritis. So I kind of, I was channeling Jenny here, the case study Jenny, I was thinking that maybe she went out to dinner with work friends and she had to work, for, she had to walk from the train station to the restaurant and that restaurant to get there, you had to walk up some stairs. Um, so I thought that might've been the situation. And then I, well, you know, putting my shoe, putting, putting my shoes, putting my feet in Jenny's shoes. I thought, well, things that she might think, well, she might think that she's going to slow everyone down that she'll think she's just that she, that they'll think that she's old and they don't respect, they won't respect her as much. And I hope I won't be in too much pain after this. So I wonder if, if you identify with any of those thought processes in, in, in a similar situation. And then, and then rating how you might feel about that. So she might feel a bit embarrassed. Out of 100%, she might feel 80% embarrassed. She also might feel a bit anxious as well because of um, um, what she people might what she thinks people might be saying about her or how she's going to feel afterwards physically with this pain um is it going to be worse is it going to disturb her sleep again okay so that's that's uh one way we can monitor our thoughts and we can capture them or or and then start to i guess um challenge them so here's activity two now before i jump into activity two um i will let you know that this session um, will probably go for another 20 minutes. So it'll be 10 minutes over, but I did intend it to be a little bit longer this session. I understand though, if you need to go, so that's not a problem. Okay. And it is recorded. So if you miss the last half or last bit, you can watch it back. Um, but we will go a little bit over. So if you'd like to stay, stay, if you've got to go, go, not a problem at all. You can catch this in the recording later. Okay. So, once you're able to um, identify unhelpful thoughts, processes, biases, um, and then monitor them, what you can then start to do is challenge those negative thoughts. And remember, this is in the context of your arthritis and pain. But we know that, like I said before, and, and like we saw in Laura Mosley's YouTube clip, many things influence our pain. So this could be you know, you could get anxious or upset about something to do with your social life or your financial life and have negative thoughts and that directly impacts your pain, okay? So you can apply it to any or all aspects um, of the way that you think and it will funnel back to helping reduce your pain. So once you've monitored your thoughts, it's time and you found unhelpful thoughts or behaviors. It's time now to challenge them and change them. Warning, the goal of cognitive restructuring in CBT, which is this, is not just to think happy thoughts. Um, that doesn't actually work, not as much as what we'd like it to, because that would be just be easy. You know, just, just be happy, just think happy things. But instead, it's actually to think more accurately. It's not about getting rid of bad emotions, okay? Um, because if somebody hurts you, you have a right to feel angry, okay? But it's about seeing things as they are and interpreting the events accurately. So kind of taking a step back and looking at a situation objectively. Interpreting events accurately um, gives us the best chance of acting appropriately, 
And so there are two ways to do this. Actually, there are many, but there are just two ways that we're going to look at tonight. Number one is perspective taking. And the other one is putting your thoughts on trial. Now, there are heaps of different CBT activities. These are just two um, slightly different ways to challenge negative thoughts. So taking a different perspective. So what you want to do is you want to challenge your thinking um, by looking at it or at the situation from a different perspective. That's about it, basically. So you want to pick a thought or an image that is unhelpful. So unhelpful meaning that it's um, it will often not make you feel very nice. Um, often putting yourself down. It's about those um, ones that we identified earlier. And you're going to challenge it by considering another perspective. And you may like to ask yourself this. What's another way of looking at this situation? Because we might be in the camp of all or nothing or should and must type thinking. So take a step back and go, well, hold on. What's a different way I can think about this? Talk to a friend. What would a friend say to me about this situation? Or what would, what would my advice be to a, to a friend about this situation? Because I bet you it's good advice, but I'm just not going to take it. Isn't that often the case? We don't practice what we preach sometimes. I thought this was funny and, and, and you might find it funny or you might not, but what would Batman say? You know, pick your favorite superhero and what would they say to you? Will I even remember this problem in 10 years time? And how would I respond to this situation if I had no fear? So these are the things that you should be asking yourself. Push the boundaries on this unhelpful thought because if you don't, what's going to happen? You're going to have an unhelpful thought that might lead to catastrophizing, to anxiety. That's going to make your pain worse. Um, you might not be able to get a good sleep, so then the next day you're not going to be able to deal with your pain as well as you could. So that's what's going to happen if you don't try this. So give it a try. Now, Again, there was a resource sent um, and I provided a template that you could do this. And I've kind of combined it with the next activity as well. But what you want to do at the end of it all is actually then reflect on how you're feeling and compare it to how you felt when you first wrote down the thought. And then how do you feel now? So you can kind of gauge if a different way of thinking or a different perspective actually helped you. And sometimes it's a good way to solve problems is to think about things from a different perspective or ask somebody else's thoughts. Okay, so this, the second one here is to put your thoughts on trial. Now you can get fully involved with this one and go judge, jury, executioner style. Uh, I stripped it back a little bit. Um, and so this one is about putting your thought, that unhelpful thought on, on the debt, on the dock. So on trial, it's up there and you're going to analyze it. So defense, what's evidence does, what evidence suggests that this thought is true? So you want to ask yourself this, is it true? What facts would a defense barrister use to convince the jury that this thought is accurate? So you have a little think about it. So you're in their shoes now. Then the prosecution. So then you think, well, what evidence is there that suggests this thought is false? So what facts would a prosecution barrister use to discredit the thought? A good example here, particularly in the context of pain and arthritis is when somebody feels a lot of pain, often there isn't a lot of tissue damage occurring. Now, remember, there are different types of arthritis. So those who have the inflammatory type, if you are in a flare state, the likelihood is, yes, some um, disruption or damage to healthy tissue may be occurring. So, of course, it, it, it doesn't, it's not the rule here, okay? Um, but there are cases where we do have, um, we do have, pain around an area where a joint that we have arthritis or again it's it's traveling but just because we have pain 
actually doesn't mean that there's always tissue damage involved. So that's a good thought to put up on the stand there and go, well, what evidence is there for and against this? And the research shows, particularly when it comes to exercise, that exercise actually doesn't damage um, joints and cartilage like people thought it did. I mean, in fact, it's actually really good for it. So we're going to weigh it up. So you weigh up the evidence for and against, and then you can talk out loud, you can talk it through your head, and then you provide a verdict. So if you like to think that way, you might be a little bit more creative in your thinking. You might like to put your thoughts on trial. Now you can have a look at that handout that I sent to you in an email and I've kind of put those two activities together, a different perspective on thinking and for and against. So we want to know and we want to really focus on how accurate um, is this unhelpful thought? How accurate is it? Okay. Another activity. So there's this one and, and, and one more. So we're almost there. This activity is called decatastrophizing. Um, and I think it's important to do because often I've seen this happen a lot with people with chronic pain. So I've actually worked with people, um, some have had arthritis, um, some have had different musculoskeletal conditions, um, but they do catastrophize a lot and it makes the situation so much worse because their nervous system is so wound up and pain is so interrelated with our nervous system and our emotions. So to bring this back down brings back our physical pain. So, so, <clears throat> so what we do here um, is number one, again, think about, start to identify what the catastrophe is. So what are you worried about? And again, this is the other handout that I've, that I've given you guys. So I put an example in here. I will never be out of pain. Think about what, what unhelpful thinking style might that be? What was that one again? Hmm. So that's my catastrophizing. Um, what am I worried about? That's that, that thought. So then what you need to do is the whole cognitive distortion of catastrophizing involves a number of elements, okay? So one is you'll often overestimate the likelihood of an event. You'll overestimate the awfulness of the event and you'll underestimate your ability to cope with the event. That's often the case. Overestimate likelihood of the event happening, overestimate the awfulness of it, and you underestimate your ability to cope with the event should it happen, okay? So decatastrophizing means that we address these as distortions. So we need to ask ourselves some hard truths or hard questions. So will I will never be out of pain. Never, never, never. So it's quite a generalized statement, isn't it? So how likely is that going to, how likely is that to happen? Well, again, everybody might find this a little bit different, but it's probably unlikely. There are going to be stages, states, and moments of time where you, you are not in pain or you have it well managed, okay? So it's actually quite unlikely. <clears throat> and it's always good to, again, try to rate yourself and how, how, um, how awful things might feel, how you feel about um, this particular thought before and then after the activity. So how likely, um, oh, sorry, yeah, how likely will it happen? Now, how awful would it be if it happened? So the example I put there would be, well, if I was never out of pain again, I would probably have to give up work. I would struggle to pay bills, look after my family. My husband and I might find it too hard to cope. What about you? Would you feel similar? Um, of course, you need to work it so it's within your context and your situation. But, you know, that's basically it. That's, that's, that's what happens when you catastrophize. So what's the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? What would a friend say to me about my worrying? So those are the sorts of things that you want to start, you want to start thinking about. And then you go, well, just supp suppose that the worst did happen. How would you cope? How would I cope? Well, 
I could say something like, well, I've had a bad pain flare before and I made it through. I can still, I could still do things and I can still do things now. So it's not as bad as what I thought it actually is. I just know what I'm in for. Um, you know, don't need to worry too much about financials. We have savings. My family, my family will help. They helped before. They'll help now. Um, I will modify my lifestyle and adjust work arrangements because that's what I did last time. So I guess if it happened again, that's how I coped last time. And I can probably cope like that this time. So this is not discrediting um, and, and looking and finding the positives or finding how you coped and not just pushing them aside. <clears throat> And the last one is what positive and reassuring thing do you want to say to yourself about the catastrophe now? So you might say something like, well, it is scary being ill or being in pain or going through a flare or having to see the doctor numerous times because my knee is so swollen. Um, it is scary and I don't know what's going to happen sometimes. Um, but I do know that I've been in a similar situation before and I know things and I, and I coped. Was it easy? No, but I did it. And I know things never stay the same at their very worst forever, okay? So um, that's how you might bring yourself down from a full-scale catastrophe. And our last one here, um, is activity four. Um, I've just, I've skipped the interactive bit. I do apologize because I know that I am going over. So I'm just working, talking through the, the last two activities now. So this one is um, interoceptive exposure or graded exposure. Okay. So the first three activities were more to do with thoughts and feelings. And this exposure activity um, is more to do with the behavior, okay? Number one being avoidance. Um, I bet we could all put our hand up in the crowd right now and say that when you've been in pain, um, you've certainly avoided doing certain things. You've moved slightly differently. Um, you get up and out of a chair differently. Um, you avoid the walk that you normally did or a certain way to get somewhere. So I think we'd all be guilty of that. It's okay every now and again, don't get me wrong, but it's what happens when um, that behavior then just becomes learned and it's what we do always. So, <clears throat> so misappraisals of body sensations trigger emotional and physiological reactions of fear and heightened arousal, which again are very interrelated um, to pain and our pain experience. So these feelings motivate behavioral responses, typically avoidance and safety behaviors intended to protect oneself from danger. These interoceptive avoidance behaviors may provide effective relief from anxiety or fear, pain, fear of pain um, in the short term, but in the long term, they prevent new learning about the true nature to treat or main, sorry, the true nature of the threat and to maintain um, a vicious cycle of anxiety um, or chronic pain. So <clears throat> this is the little... Um, vicious cycle that often happens when we're in pain so we might have these body sensations so low back pain um, pain in knee hip neck um, we we feel this um, we don't like it it's threatening to us that's what like pain is it's a danger signal so of course it's threatening we might then become fearful or anxious of that and that leads us to be more hypervigilant, more sensitive about feeling that pain or that, that body sensation again. And then that continues. Body sensation, it's threatening. I'm fearful of it. And it leads to, well, I better look out for it so I don't, do I don't move that way again. And it continues and it continues. 
So <clears throat> fears of body sensations can be increased or perpetuated due to avoidance, safety seeking behaviors. So um, safety seeking behaviors, trying to avoid having those bodily sensations, obviously, or avoiding places where they tend to happen. And that may not be a good thing because you might really enjoy meeting up with your friends for coffee and then going for a walk or doing some form of exercise. But then you might end up wanting to avoid that situation altogether because you feel you feel pain. And so you'll avoid the places and the people. And then what are you doing? You're isolating yourself. And so this means that there are fewer opportunities to learn how dangerous they really are. So we want to avoid the, 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 that pain, right? It's dangerous to us. Um, we think that it is dangerous to us when in fact, um, it's probably not. We're just, too, we're just a little sensitive to that particular movement or that particular place. <clears throat> Likewise, safety-seeking behaviours prevent learning about um, true, the, like the true level of danger. We've also got the catastrophic misinterpretations. So this is um, meanings or beliefs. So having negative beliefs about the symptoms, so I won't be able to cope, for example, or this is dangerous, increases the level of panic. And it means that symptoms may more likely be feared and then, of course, avoided. And then interoceptive conditioning. So if the symptom precedes an experience of anxiety, the body will become sensitive to it. So again, it's another learned response. Learned that this symptom predicts fear. It, it, it's fairly common when it comes to people who live with musculoskeletal conditions and pain uh, who have developed chronic pain. Um, I've treated many people who have suffered a, a low back injury the low back injury, the tissue itself has healed, um, yet they still can't reach down to tie their shoelaces. Um, but there's no damage left. Um, but it's because they know that when they did it before, that they caused pain, it was threatening. There was fear and anxiety that there was going to be more pain, but there was more fear and anxiety about what it meant for work. Like maybe they couldn't work, for example. And then they became hypervigilant about that particular body sensation. So take a moment to think now, is there a movement, activity or exercise that you may avoid because you know that it causes you pain? Or have you adopted a different way of moving to avoid pain? Do you avoid going to particular areas, events? Do you avoid particular people because they're, they're active people and you might feel you can't keep up and it causes pain and then you're in that vicious cycle. Have a think. Is that you? Because then what you're going to do is then expand on that. And the last activity is a bit of exposure here being this, again, this template here. So the physiological symptom, the system, should I say, is nociceptive, um, which is a cell in all of our bodies that detects danger. And this is danger messages will be sent to our brain and we would interpret that as pain. Um, so that's the physiological system that we're dealing with. Um, examples of symptoms that and threat appraisals, so obviously pain um, and the threat appraisal would be, oh, if I'm feeling pain, this is causing me permanent damage. And the interoceptive exposure exercise. Um, and, you will, and you can also do graded exposure as well. So incrementally, slowly increase doing the movement or going to the place where you feel or felt that pain and that fear and anxiety. So it could be performing bending a particular type of lift. It could be walking, um, movements that, you know, whatever those movements were that were cause, that caused concern for you. Um, and using graded exposure into increasing that range of motion or that intensity or that frequency of which you did that exercise. Now, 
you may like to do this, and I would say, and I would certainly encourage to do so, um, do this with a physio, an exercise physiologist, or an occupational therapist. They can help you with graded exposure. Um, it's basically just retraining your brain not to be so afraid or not to be so hypervigilant of a certain body sensation, that being pain. Um, and like I was saying before with that previous um, example, there are many other examples that I have working with people with arthritis um, <clears throat> that are and do avoid, pain, uh, do avoid movement. So they'll have a much more sedentary lifestyle, but we know that actually that's the complete opposite of what they should be doing. Exercise is essential for the health of your cartilage, no matter what arthritis you have. Exercise helps move the synovial fluid around the joint. And the synovial fluid is what nourishes the cartilage. We need to keep that nourished. We need to keep it lubricated. The more we do that, the less friction, the less stiffness, and the less pain that we may feel. Not only that, it keeps our muscles and our bones strong. Okay. So in summary... Remember, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are interrelated and they share a bi-directional relationship with our pain experience. So any one of them can um, influence the other. Thoughts influencing pain, pain influencing thoughts, influencing feelings. It's all just one big um, web, basically. Spider's web, it's all connected. <clears throat> when we're in pain, this ramps up our nervous system and can negatively affect our thoughts, our feelings and behaviours. And when we engage in avoidance behaviours, um, when we catastrophize, when we feel anxious, we have depressed feelings, frustrated, this also ramps up our nervous system, which in turn obviously increases our experience of pain. So to reduce the pain experience, we want to reduce, challenge, change our thoughts, feelings, or behaviors. And we've discussed a few ways in which you can do that tonight. So I am identifying unhelpful thinking styles. So to change them, you need to identify them. So you need to be, um, you need to be reflective or take the time um, to reflect on what you think and what you feel in a particular situation. Once you've found them, you want to challenge your negative thoughts and you might like to do this looking at, you know, through a different lens, using different perspectives or putting it on trial and finding out the accuracy of those thoughts. You can start to work your way through decatastrophizing a situation. So asking about... Um, the likelihood of a situation, how awful would it be, how would you cope, and then how do you feel about it now? And then there's the exposure, interoceptive and graded exposure for the behaviours, like the avoidance and the safety-seeking behaviours that so often come with pain issues. Okay, and that brings us to the end. <laughs> so... Quarter to, quarter to nine. Thank you for hanging around with me tonight. Um, like I said, I, I, I told you it was going to probably run over a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to stop the share there. There we go. So um, I hope that tonight um, was interesting at the very least. I hope that it perhaps gave you some tools in which to help challenge maybe some of your unhelpful thoughts um, and how you might then go ahead or look forward to dealing with your pain and any of the thoughts that surround that um, under the umbrella that is arthritis. Um, um, as it is very, um, as it is getting pretty late, I may not be able to answer these any questions that you've put in the chat box. Um, 
But what I am available, but I am available though, if you would like to email me. So um, if you don't have it, I'll put it in here now. I'm more than happy to have an, to receive an email from you. Arthritis New South Wales .org.au. <coughs> if you have a question, really, really happy to answer that. I'm also on the 1800 number. You can always call me too. Um, not saying that I've got all the answers. I don't. But if you did want to have a chat, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But I just wanted you to get an idea of what CBT is. And if you were to see a, a, a psychologist um, about it, it'd be a little bit more structured. And there's a lot more to it. But they're just some of the tools in which would be used to challenge um, and change some of those thoughts that you may be struggling with when it comes to your, your chronic illness and the the pain that comes with it okay you think distraction helps you like going for a movie or somewhere you, you forget the pain distraction some kind of, yeah some kind of distraction yes distraction is a good method um tool to use um not not to use as you're avoiding um, you never want to. Um, you don't want to. You don't ever want to negatively reinforce something. And avoidance can do this, but avoidance. Um, but to distract, absolutely, to take your mind off something else. And um, we've spoken about that before when we've spoken about mindfulness. So distraction um, um, is just a form of, of mindfulness, essentially. So focusing on something else. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, um, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Email me any of your questions. Um, I'd be happy, more than happy to answer them. There's also a survey that you can also um, put some um, feedback in, and that's also very helpful. So good night, everybody. And we'll talk soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah.